four million years later. Thank you for downloading and listening to the Four Million Years Later podcast, a show where two Gen Xer friends get together and uh, watch an episode of Transformers and then get together and talk about that episode of Transformers. Uh, Generation One, watching the show in order. My name is Jersey Drozd. I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other Gen Xer is? I'm Hoover. <laughs> <laughs> spoken like a Gen Xer. I only said that, I wasn't saying that to like start any kind of like culture where I was just like s- s- thinking that's a really succinct way of saying what time we were born. Right? I don't know. We Isn't it a little vague? I thought, uh, is it? I thought those things were kind of like hard to nail down. I was born in 1976. How about that? There we go. 74. Yeah. So we were, we were there at the beginning is this is what you would really need to glean from that. We were there at the beginning of Transformers. Which is an accident of birth, not a point of pride, right? It's not like, I was there for the original. <laughs> well, I would say I would say both. I mean, if I had to pick any time to be around, the 80s toy scene was, was probably the greatest. And I'm happy to have been there to see it and not just see it in JPEGs. Uh that 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 part, like when I was blissfully unaware of how dangerous and scary the world was, that part was pretty. Oh cool. sure, yeah, that too. <laughs> when I wasn't getting bullied at the playground, and when I wasn't aware that we were on the brink of nuclear war, <laughs> yeah, the, the Toy Story was wonderful. Right, yeah. That's all <laughs> when that I wasn't aware of all the inequities in the world, <laughs> yeah. All those Toys bad things didn't wonderful. matter when you had uh, four hundred GI <laughs> Joe figures on the peg at once. <laughs> Did you ever have that many? Uh, maybe not GI Joe, but I've definitely seen pictures of that many Star Wars figures on the peg from around that same oh time. Oh my gosh! Oh, oh, on the you mean hanging on the peg on the card? Got yeah. it. I got it. I thought you meant like on the battle. Oh no, I, I didn't own like four hundred mint on card toys as a kid. If that's what you thought I meant. <laughs> Well, only child. They, in my mind, like it, 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 I knew, I had friends who were only children, and their their toy collections always seemed so, like Raiders of the Lost Ark, like that, mm. like the ending scene, just like rows and rows of everything in the world compared to like my toy shelf, which was half broken everything because my siblings destroyed all my stuff. Sure. But we're not here to talk about. Well, we are here to talk about our childhoods to an extent, but through the lens, through the window, through the framework of talking about Transformers episodes, and we are on episode six. Yeah, we Divide made and it through episode six, people. That's amazing. They said it couldn't be done, but here we are. So <laughs> Divide and Conquer, written by Donald F. Glutt. I have not seen this name before. Is this a, a, a new you know, writer in the series? Well, this is the man who wrote the novelization of another little thing from the 80s called Empire Strikes Back. Oh my gosh, you're kidding me. Mm-mm. Oh, I'm so tempted to go on a tangent because I read that as a kid. <laughs> I remember reading because I was so excited about the movie, and I was just like, "Oh, this is this is so much not not as interesting as the movie." <laughs> but that, that might have been like my my relationship with reading as a young person. Um, <laughs> There's no pictures here. <laughs> now I just remember like it, it's Han Solo on the Tauntaun in the snow for a long time, and he's he's like contemplating how his name means alone. And I was like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so here comes the log line for the episode divide and conquer optimus sacrifices himself to protect the humans to repair him the autobots need an extra cosmotron from wheeljack's lab on cybertron can they get it in time before the decepticons act on their advantage <laughs> so another one that i i got a lot of mileage when i was a kid i watched this one a lot and i and i if i remember we had this one on vhs i'm pretty sure we did at my parents video store We've talked before about how the Gen 1 series, I wouldn't call it joyless, but it is very serious, mm-hmm. comparatively speaking. It's a, it's a, I'm surprised at how serious this show feels compared to virtually everything else that Sunbow was doing at the time. And this episode, like, really starts with a very scary, serious tone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, at the time... I guess sort of the default for cartoons was to be like super friends. You know, they were, there was always a laugh here and there. What with Wendy and Marvin or the wonder twins, you know, there was that sort of built in humor where writers back then just thought it was sort of a necessary thing for kids. Cause kids, kids like to laugh. 
even G.I. Joe, though, you had, like, in the first miniseries, you had Steeler and Short Fuse, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you had, then you had, like, Alpine and Bazooka later on. And so, like, these these series had, like, funny-ish characters. Mm -hmm. um, not, not only is Transformers really, like, th th not focusing on that in this first series. Like, there's no character showing up to be like, hi, I'll be your funny character for the episode. Mm -hmm. But this episode starts with factories you know, it's like it's victor caroli comes in with this scary voice and he's like factories are bu busy building weapons to, what was it, to defend themselves against the 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 worst menace humanity's ever faced how does it how does the quote go i bet you can roll a clip factories are busy manufacturing weapons to be used against the greatest threat the world has ever known evil super powerful robots decepticons and so what are we seeing while this scary <laughs> this scary uh, preamble is happening well naturally we see a bunch of uh people in the traditional hard hat garb see uh, yellow yeah. hard hats tan jackets and blue pants because that's all that humans wear in this series <laughs> You know, I just, it, this literally just occurred to me now. You know how, like, if an alien species were to encounter us, like, the differences that are so important to us would be so hard for them to detect because all they'd really be looking at is, like, the general features of, like, mm -hmm. head, arms, legs, torso. Yeah. I wonder if, like, that's what humans look like to Decepticons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, what are you talking about? This is a J. Crew shirt. And it's like, yeah. Yeah. And what, what if, like, the show is just from like a, from a robot point of view and and they just think well that's what humans do they put on their hard hat after they wake up they put on their tan jacket and put on some pants blue of course and uh, then they're ready to go <laughs> and like if you go back like only like five guys that they ever met wore yellow hard hats but that just stood out and like yeah they all wear hard hats no they don't skywarp look again <laughs> oh you know what they don't oh that's funny how memory works <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, we see yellow, yellow hard-hatted dudes in this factory, and like, there's this poster of Megatron on the wall, like a propaganda poster. Says like the enemy across his chest. <laughs> and I remember that poster popping up in one of your early comics. Oh, you're right. I think in a oh, uh, alleyway. It was in one of my digest minis. Yeah, it was um, a comic I did in 1995, I want to say. And it was a digest sort of mini comic, and it was um, the opening first panel. It was a splash page of our hero mm -hmm. running down an alleyway, and on the wall is a poster that says has a picture of Megatron. I think Megatron didn't look quite as like majestic as it does <laughs> in this episode. He's like more like what? And then it just says the enemy across his chest. Yeah, I don't know. It's just it's just that feels like just so grim compared to mm -hmm. like gi joe duke doesn't have posters of cobra commander that says the enemy across it mm -hmm. all over gi joe headquarters right but here we have like a munitions plant uh you know probably government contracted munitions plant and there's posters of megatron like don't forget we hate this guy right right wow again very serious in tone but then we see like to, to like de-seriousize it also, we see people are like, who are we going to get to consult the weapons manufacturing? <laughs> oh, let's get that like really square, uh, happy, cheerful guy, Chip Chase, who shows up. <laughs> Chip is back. <laughs> Which, mixed feelings, you know, mixed feelings on like, Chip, I love you, like top to bottom, but like, really? You're going to like get all like Manhattan Project now and start <laughs> like help manufacture weapons of destruction because you're scared of the enemy? There's only one smart person in this universe. <laughs> 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 i think it's like it's like he's like stepping up efficiency to increase weapons output <laughs> mm -hmm. which apparently uh equals pushing a few buttons on a computer and then suddenly oh weapons output is increased there, i i do want to say there's a couple moments in here where i feel like there's like a lot of really lovely kid logic and then also like really reflective of the time it comes from and like there's a there's a cliche that I, I feel like began in the late 70s, early 80s, where it's like, we got to, you know, show somebody being like really, really like a big wizard with computers. And it always meant like typing super fast. And <laughs> and that's what Chip is doing here. But then suddenly they're interrupted. Yep. Starscream, Thundercutter, and Skywarp are attacking the plant. They shoot their way in. They literally blow a hole in the side of the wall. And they zoom into the plant while in jet mode. Which seems like a terrible idea, 
Because, I mean, have you ever known a factory to be just like completely spacious and empty like an empty warehouse? I mean, these are jets <laughs> flying in at Mach whatever into right, a like, closed building. Like this this is them showing off their precision and control yeah, I as guess so. flyers, I guess. Because like, it, like if that were real, yes, the moment they fly, by, like there's a shot where we're looking over Chip's shoulder as he's watching the three jets fly by. It's like, no, Chip, you would have been swept up <laughs> off of the platform <laughs> and sucked into the air by like the, the, the wake of those jets flying through. But they just like <laughs> gently fly in and then transform into robot mode. Yep. And they're attacked by armed guards. And thankfully, this one time, they don't color the armed guards like uh, they're wearing hard hats and all that. So they're actually in green uh, security type uniforms. But three little guys with guns, they're not going to do much here. So Starscream manages to scare them off with one little cannon blast. And Thundercracker remarks, <laughs> Humans run funny, don't they, Starscream? <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's our salt of the earth Decepticon Thundercracker once again. <laughs> Joe, he's the Joe six pack of the Decepticons uh, or what do they call it John Q public <laughs> but yeah and then like while Thundercracker's getting his giggles from the way humans run <laughs> Skywarp uses his superpower again yep he teleports behind the security and then scares them off again and then uh, Soundwave flies in the Decepticons begin their usual MO of making Energon cubes as Skywarp teleports again in front of the big factory machine to fill one of the Energon cubes up. Can I say just real quick that this is something that I feel like gets a little lost down the road. Um, I can't think of many episodes where the Decepticons are like kind of playful with terrorizing mm. humans. It's usually when Megatron isn't around. <laughs> you think that's it it's kind of like you know it's when the boss isn't there at work it's like oh you can goof around a little bit as you work <laughs> i just yeah i like the idea of the decepticons being a little bit more expressive of who they are so it's nice to see them enjoy their job yeah you, you'll notice skywarp doesn't have to request any permission to teleport oh that's true so he starts just doing it indiscriminately. Yep. Like Skywarp, go over there. And I'm like, all right, yes, we know. You could teleport. That's very impressive. <laughs> Look at me. I'm amazed. <laughs> and there are way too many coloring errors in these scenes. Half the time, Thundercracker is painted like Starscream, and half the time, Skywarp is painted like both of them. And it's just a big mess. And I even checked on the DVDs to see if the quote unquote finished version had been fixed. But nope, they're all just messed up. The Tubi version, which are the Rhino Masters, and the quote-unquote fixed Shout Factory version DVDs, they're, they're all got the same coloring error, so it's just a big mess. That's the service that Hoover provides yes. for everybody, is you don't have to go double-check this. They're all like this. So whatever version you're seeing with them, where, where it's like Starscream teleporting, yeah. but talking with Skywarp's voice, well, that's, that's the version that we got. Is this the part where like we cut the chip and the other scientist and like Chip says, "Don't cash in your computer chips just yet." <laughs> well, of course, uh, Chip's got to oh. contact the Autobots. Yeah, he's like, "There may be a few more buttons we can push." <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's so wonderfully square. How oh, I love him so much. Um, so then, then when we, he calls the Autobots, which means we have to go to Autobot headquarters, and who all is there? Oh, we see Ratchet, Blue Streak, Wheeljack, Trailbreaker, Bumblebee, Ironhide, and Sparkplug. So that's a good number of original guys. It's not all of them, but it's a good half or so. Mm -hmm. And they're Skyping with Optimus, who's in the former riverbed location of the Space Bridge. He's there with Spike. He's trying to find uh, any remnants of the Space Bridge, but the Decepticons took it all back. So it seems to have been moved to a different location. Two things here. One, we're still in the part of the series where it's building a continuity, mm -hmm. right? We're not in full on like reset at the end of the episode episodic. You can jumble it up in any order. Like the fact that Optimus is in the riverbed looking for the space bridge. You don't need to know this, but if you know this, it fleshes out the story more that yes, the previous episode, 
That's where the space bridge was, and that's why Optimus is there looking for it. And it's established in previous episodes, the space bridge moves location and only can operate in certain time periods, which we had our own speculations as to why that was, something mm-hmm. to do with like inter- interplanetary alignments and so on. But yeah, that's that's. I, I thought that that was a nice, subtle way to say that, okay, these, these stories are connected in some way. And I met, would imagine you, of all people, would appreciate that most of all. Oh, yeah. I think I really like the, I would call it, for the time, a new take on cartoon continuity where there's, you know, it's, it's not just reset at the end of every episode, at least not yet. Uh, we're, like, building on each other's stories, which is extra relevant because there's different people writing most of these stories from episode to episode so Mm -hmm. they had to be at least like okay my episode gets us to this point and uh, so have your episode take us from there and that sort of thing either that sort of communication or they were done the previous episode was done uh, before the episode the person was writing something like that there was definitely Mm -hmm a sort of through line and continuity to this at this point. I do have to to speculate that I think what I was feeling at the time when I was watching this show, and I don't think I would have had the words for it at the time, but I, I know I probably did have the words for it by the time I encountered Robotech, the Macross saga, mm-hmm. which was very much like you can't watch it out of order. Right. Like you're not supposed to. Is that it felt like the writers were trusting me more as a viewer. Hmm. Right? Like as a kid, it felt like most Saturday morning and after after school cartoons were that kind of like you could jumble it up, you know, syndicate it, put it out of order. It doesn't really matter. They're all done in one self-contained. And I love those kinds of stories. But the moment I encountered something where it was really asking me to pay attention and remember details I, I do remember thinking this about Robotech. It's like, oh, this this feels more sophisticated and mature, even if it isn't what one would call sophisticated and mature, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. It's almost like moving up to young adult chapter books from picture books or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Which, as an adult, not that important to me, but as a kid, it's so vitally important to not be considered a kid, right? Mm. Yeah, there's a lot of hair splitting like, well... I'm no dumb third grader. I'm a smart fourth grader. You know that. <laughs> I'm a smart thing. fourth grader. Oh yeah, I remember being in like second grade and seeing sixth graders and thinking like they're practically grown ups. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, uh, so Optimus is in the riverbed looking for the space bridge. He's like, I can't find it. I looked <laughs> under every rock. It's nowhere. <laughs> uh, and then all of a sudden, like something lights up. He's getting the distress call from Chip Chase. And he turns to the screen and he utters that iconic phrase. Autobots, transform and meet me there. Uh, Okay, we're not there yet. Still, still, Optimus is still workshopping. Autobots, transform and meet me there. What what if, Hoover, I just had a terrible thought. What if we find out (laughs) in through doing this episode by episode analysis that he actually only says it like twice in the Terry series. <laughs> or what if he never says it at all and it's just like the Mandela effect. It's like, no, he said Transformer and roll out every time. <laughs> yeah, it's like the Berenstain Bears thing. It's like we're in an alternate timeline where he never said it. <laughs> and at the end of this podcast, they just lock us away because we just go crazy. It's like, no, that's not how it happened. <laughs> Yeah, it's the final panels of the of the of our story is the f- slow pull away of us like psycho pirate in the corner of the insane <laughs> asylum at the end of Crisis and Infinite Earths. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, he says transform and meet me there. And they're like, okay, well, we got to meet him there. And then Ironhide issues the order. Yeah, Jazz is nowhere to be found, so Ironhide uh, starts issuing the orders. Jazz is probably off driving, listening to music. He's been demoted, so uh, Ironhide seems to be calling the shots, at least without Prime there. Mm-hmm. So back to the plants, Skywarp remarks that they've drained the plant dry, and they've made a huge pile of energon cubes as tall as them, and all nicely stacked. And the plant manager and Chip, who are still there, still basically having gone unmoved in the plant, they fear that their SOS went unheard. As Starscream radios in. Mission leader to Decepticon headquarters. Acknowledge Megatron. Megatron here. Report mission leader, Starscream. I feel like this is a very 
Hoover centric scene because there's a lot for you to read into here. And I'm curious what your thoughts are <laughs> on what, what's the dynamic that's at work between these characters as they're talking to each other. Well, I do really like that Starscream refers to himself as mission leader. He's like, if I call myself mission leader, <laughs> maybe I'll get to hear Megatron refer to me as leader. <laughs> and like Starscream's recording it so he can just clip out the mission the <laughs> leader Starscream and he just, that's like he sets that as his uh, his text alert on his phone leader Starscream leader Starscream leader Starscream leader Starscream yeah so <sighs> thankfully Megatron sarcastically replies to mission leader Starscream and he instructs him to b- bring the Energon Cubes to Decepta Town under the sea. And Starscream, not all that subtly, fishes for compliments on his job, but he's interrupted by Optimus Prime driving through their pile of Energon Cubes. And then doesn't, doesn't Starscream do like a, oh, Optimus Prime! <laughs> <sighs> and so Megatron's still on the Skype call with him, so he orders Starscream to destroy Prime, since they outnumber him three to one. Which begs the question, where did Soundwave go? Because he's suddenly not right. here anymore. He was there in the beginning, wasn't yep. he? Maybe yeah. he's just like printing up some empty Energon cubes for him and then, bye, I got things to do. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Gotta stop at the grocery store, sale on <laughs> biscuits. So, there we have... Uh, Starscream actually attacks Optimus, and he gets a great shot in. He blasts Prime into the wall. Mm. It's it is it is comparatively rare, like for Starscream to actually first hit his target, and mm-hmm. second of all, like do anything that would like phase another character. Yeah, right. It's it, it's weird to see him be effective. Mm-hmm. Totally. And then Thundercracker launches some missiles at Prime, but Prime shoots them out of the air. And then Skywarp launches a heat-seeking missile at him, which Prime also makes short work of. But in a rare use of teamwork, Starscream lunges at Prime, shoves him into a wall, causes him to drop his rifle, uh, and then the rifle goes off and hits the computer behind Chip. So seeing Chip's Mm -hmm. in danger, Prime unleashes a stiff left hand to Starscream, sending him flying and scrambles to get between the impending explodey computer and human, narrowly saving them as the computer explodes in Prime's face. How much on the edge of your seat is Young Jersey at this point? Um, I do remember the... Well, we're, we haven't gotten to the commercial break yet, but yeah, this one was one that I watched, I think it was on a Saturday morning, and um, we had the promise of another episode, but because of the serious tone of this show, the stakes of Optimus getting blowed up by a, a com- exploding munitions plant computer. And then immediately after, like while he's standing there staggering, right? Mm-hmm. He's like, the wall explodes on him and he's like, kind of like, whoa, whoa, that was something. And then Starscream's like, hit him with everything. And mm-hmm. all three seekers open fire on Optimus's chest. And you hear him do like this, ah, and he's, he falls to the ground. It was intense. I remember thinking, like, maybe not, like, fear. I didn't feel fear necessarily, but, like, thrill of, like, oh, my gosh, there's stakes in the show. Mm -hmm. Again, nothing I would have said as an 11-year-old, but, like, that was the feeling at the time. We didn't have anything like this before. No. And it's it's even, like, comparatively to what we get in the next year or so in this show, it's very violent. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's extremely violent. And, again... I think there's other places where we can go into this in the in future episodes, but I got super mixed feelings about that now. It's I, actually I'm, I'm going to dog ear this for further for discussion in the episode. I feel like this one has the promise of some really interesting exploration of the idea of what's the role of leadership, and then they just totally drop it at the end. Mm. Uh, it was it's one of those ones where it's like, wow, it seems like you're setting up something really interesting to like explain what's the relationship and role of leadership in a, in, a, in a team, and then like. They get to the very end of the episode. It's like, oh, no, you're just saying that like leaders are like the fundamental, most important piece of an organization. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but because uh, like, yeah, like you've got also now we're in full on middle aged Optimus, who's like the more fatherly, like when he gets in front of the computer to shield uh, Chip and the other scientist, he says, I will shield you. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no smart alecky vehicular pun. Mm-mm. You know, it's, it's it's just very like, I am so freaking noble that I'm going to stand in front of this exploding wall. 
he gets shot in the chest <laughs> by a bunch of bad guys, right? <laughs> and Prime goes down. And so the other Autobots show up and, you know, it's like, okay, well, you've got like the advantage of the demoralizing image of your leader being de- incapacitated. So surely Starscream, Thundercracker, and Skywarp are going to capitalize that to take on all the rest of the Autobots and brutalize them too, right? <laughs> No, and uh, Starscream's probably going to say it's Megatron's idea, but Megatron orders his <laughs> troops to escape with the Energon Cubes, knowing that they're well outnumbered now. And Starscream, probably back at the base, would say, you know, I wanted to take on all the rest of the Autobots, <laughs> but Megatron told me to get out of there. And I rolled my eyes, and I said, oh, I suppose. <laughs> and he makes a big W on his forehead. Whatever, Megatron. <laughs> I totally could have won. Just didn't want to. So... Ironhide's like, as they're flying away, he's like, ah, we'll get them. But Spike says, you can't. <laughs> because Optimus is laying there completely, uh, you know, smoldering and disheveled. He's, he, but now in, in Optimus switches to talking like Omega Supreme here. Mm. Yeah, he's, uh, he's very hurt. So he's not, he's not giving any flowery speeches at this point. Yeah. It's like... Wheeljack, can you repair me? Uh, not here. We got to get you back to base. Can you transform? Because you are far too big for any of us to carry you. So he's like, I'll try. Transforms to truck mode. And they start driving back to base. And now we get to Spike and Chip inside. They're in Bumblebee, right? Yeah, that's mm-hmm. right. And it's like, boy, do you think you think Optimus is going to pull through? And Spike, Spike of all ca- characters. And I think this is another reason that this episode felt so kind of dreadful to me as, as a young person. Because, like, again, very serious in tone. Spike says, I don't know. He was hit pretty bad. Yep. Even Bumblebee doesn't like it. It's like, gosh, you guys lighten up. <laughs> so then we go back to Decepticon headquarters, right? Yep, the Decepticons arrive back at Decepticon under the sea and stack up their newly gotten Energon cubes in a nice little stack because remember how much Megatron loves cleanliness. I don't remember this. <laughs> Where did this come from? <laughs> remember Megatron has a little <laughs> sop vac in his chest when he needs oh, to clean right. things up? <laughs> I forgot. You got to keep track of our own fanon, man. <laughs> That's right. Okay. So yeah, stack it. They stack it up neatly, and Megatron says, "Ah, what's the condition of Optimus Prime?" And Starscream says, "Starscream is certain that he's dead because he saw him fall." <laughs> Typical Starscream. But Megatron asks Hi. if he can be certain that his laser core was extinguished. So that brings the question to mind is a laser core like an old-fashioned word for spark which wasn't invented Mm. until beast wars is it the same thing or is it different Mm. entirely who knows we can only sort of put this stuff together in our own little minds uh in in the episcopalian version (laughs) of cybertronian religion the spark is called the laser core Mm. there we go omegatron has to know if, if Optimus survived that. So he orders Soundwave to dispatch the laser beak, and Megatron personally orders him to go to Autobot HQ and learn Prime's condition. Oh, that's right. He says, come to me. Mm-hmm. You know? like, And then laser beak goes and flies and lands on his forearm. Yep. And he's, he's like, yeah, go there and like tell me how, you know, what is it? Op- tell me, th- let me know the condition of Optimus Prime. And Laserbeak, like, starts flapping his wings and squawking. Yeah, he shows some cowardice and doesn't seem keen on the idea, which is pretty much the first and only time we see Laser Laserbeak react that way. And Skywarp mm-hmm. remarks that, I think Laserbeak's chicken. And then Megatron says, he'll have more to fear if he does not obey me. And his eyes glow when he says it, which is like, <laughs> How how awesome would it be to do that? Yeah, I wish I could just do that on command each day. <laughs> but this is really the only time we see Laserbeak do this. And this actually comes directly from his file card where it calls him, quote, noticeably not brave. Really? Is that the expression? Yes. <laughs> noticeably not brave? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he's not a coward. <laughs> he's just not brave. <laughs> Oh, that's good. Yeah, so this was supposed to be part of Laserbeak's character, and I'm pretty sure I remember it being as such in the coloring books, which I think came out even before the show. But uh, no one ever really touches on it again. So it's like, Mm. meh. Wow. So Laserbeak sneaks into Autobot HQ, and this is sort of an interesting scene, because the Autobots are walking into HQ. You see Brawn and Windcharger walking in. And so Laserbeak... And Gears. Don't forget Gears, your favorite. Oh, okay. 
And then the <laughs> laser beak uh, glides in behind them, turns into a cassette, and lands on Braun's shoulder. <laughs> this is how laser beak's going to sneak in. So it's like, okay, that's. I guess that makes sense. Uh, Braun's just not very uh, observant that something just landed on his shoulder, but okay. He's, he, his shoulders are so broad because he's so strong <laughs> that he can't even notice. What was that? You know, like uh, you know, like a boulder falls. I was like, was that a fly laying on my shoulder? <laughs> right. That's how yeah. strong I am. I'm brawn. Yep. You know, <laughs> it would it would be uh, losing face for him to notice anything touching his shoulder. <laughs> so then, once they walk inside, Laser Beak transforms again and uh, flies off into a corner where he isn't seen. And he starts spying via his little head camera, which he uses pretty often. No, no, they they change the camera. Oh. Um, this they they yeah. Usually the camera comes out of the top of his head, right? Mm -hmm. This time, one of his you know there's those two jet engines on his back. One of the grills of one of those engines slides open, and a like a weird snake like well, it's square, but it like moves like a snake, it, like snakes out of that hole. So he's got like a shoulder cam. I guess it's like his high def camera. <laughs> this this is the uh, original recipe before it's upgraded to a newer, smaller model. Or it could be no. If we're gonna get all fanning, that's part of what we're supposed to do with this show, right? Is the head camera is when he's recording for local playback, so like he has to get back to Soundwave to play that back. The shoulder camera is for live feed. No, we're not nerds at all, kids. What are you talking about? <laughs> That was Hoover's way of approving what I just said. <laughs> so, yeah, so he's, he put, turns on the shoulder cam, and then we cut to, he's looking at them, and they're like, oh, I don't know, guys, it looks pretty bad. Yeah, Prime's on the operating table, essentially. And yeah. uh, Wheeljack and Ratchet are checking him out. And Huffer fe fears the worst here, because he's Huffer, and that's what he does. He's doomed, I know it. I can feel it in my data bank. Now here is one of those moments where I feel like, oh, they're building something that's going to have a really cool payoff in this episode that, that they don't quite get to, in that Huffer's there to say, okay, I am the soldier watching my leader potentially dying, and I'm giving up the ship. It's like, oh, he's doomed. It's all over. We can't do anything without him. <laughs> it's like, okay, that's setting up for later on when Huffer's going to be like, well, maybe. Maybe we could do something about this. But then it turns out that he's they need the leader after all, right? <laughs> but it's like, it feels so much like, okay, you've set up the fact that this guy is terrified. He's about to en encounter a change in the premise of the story that he is not ready for. And then he's going to have to step up and be a better Huffer than he was before, mm. right? That's what I feel like that line is about for me. Anyway, I, I, and I know it's, it's Huffer and he's got that high voice that we've made fun of for years and years, but... <laughs> But character growth can come from anywhere. But that, that, yes, we, we cut back to uh, Decepticon headquarters. And Megatron is watching the live feed, right? Mm -hmm. and, like when he sees, what is it, Sparkplug is like, I don't know, guys. Looks pretty bad. And Megatron's like, all right. <laughs> so. so Megatron orders Laserbeak to finish him off. And Laserbeak yeah. uh, flies around. And he uses his eye lasers to fire into Prime's open chest, causing a big mm -hmm. explosion as we head to commercial break. Talk about violent. Prime is basically in a hospital bed with his chest uh -huh. open. Laser beak yeah. fires into the chest and a giant explosion covers him. And it's not even just a giant explosion. Wheeljack says, get back, everybody. He's about to explode. And then he explodes. <laughs> so, like, I'm I'm 11 years old and I'm watching this at, like, 7 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. I'm like, what, 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 what? You just, you just, like... Showed the bad guy open fire on a guy in, uh, encountering or uh, enduring open heart surgery, right? Mm -hmm. And then the dude explodes into the screen. The whole screen becomes fire before yeah. it goes to commercial. So Man. you're not really feeling these Apple Jacks commercials and, and Happy Meal commercials. J for Apple. J for Jacks. No, no. I... Soon all the Cap'n Crunch cereal will be mine. That's the thought. We gotta stop him from finding the Cap'n Crunch. Captain Crunch can just, he could go sink his ship because I do not care about what's happening. <laughs> I don't care what products you're trying to push at me. All I care about is like, what did I just see? Is he dead? Did I just watch Optimus Prime die on TV? No, Hasbro would never kill Optimus Prime. <laughs> oh, that's right, because they care about our psyches. <laughs> <laughs> So the commercials end, and Prime is somehow 
okay and in one piece. But yeah, Wheeljack says he needs a new Cosmotron. Okay, we don't know what that is, but okay. And Wheeljack has one, but it's yeah. in his lab on Cybertron. Oh no! And, and Spike and, and Chip both say it in in, in unison, Cybertron. <laughs> And that, but but to make matters worse, <laughs> it's not just bad that it's a whole planet away. <laughs> and to make matters worse, the Decepticons put a computerized lock on the door. Oh no! Not a lock, <laughs> and not just a lock, a computerized lock. Oh man! Let's just destroy <laughs> Prime <laughs> now. We've got no hope. <laughs> euthanasia call dr kevorkian no to put it in perspective i thought about this line because that line happened i thought the same thing like that's kind of a silly thing to say like they, to make matters worse we don't have to just travel across the galaxy with no ship we have to but unlock a, computer- a door <laughs> that's a computerized lock so i was thinking about okay like what were we going through at the time now when i was in fifth grade our my fifth grade teacher got a commodore 64 computer to for the classroom which was like you know, it's like holy cow! Mm. We just like entered the 21st century, right? And we he actually bought for the classroom books on computer programming, like how to make your own games. They're all those text based games, like Oregon Trail kind of thing. Yeah. But I remember having to write lines of code. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, go to line 10, stop. Yes. Uh, you know, go, go to line <laughs> eight, repeat, and whatever. If a string equals yes, then yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like. The idea of computers, they, they were, they were personal computers were like a thing at this point, but they were still kind of an exotic, you know, not everybody had them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and the way you engage with them, like even when you wanted, like, let's say you had Ghostbusters on floppy disks to play on your Commodore 64, you still like to put it in the game, you had to go like load Ghostbusters comma eight comma one or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Um, like it was all text commands to just get the thing to work. So when Wheeljack says it's a computerized lock, I have to think, I don't remember for sure, but like, I have to think that my 11 year old brain was like, oh no, they're going to have to write lines of code. (laughs) (laughs) I know how hard that is. (laughs) You might as well tell me it's impossible, even if I do have a spaceship. They're going to have to type unlock door, comma, eight, comma, one, and they can possibly (laughs) do that correctly, not with those big fingers. You're going to get a syntax error for sure. And Huffer knows what I was talking, what I'm talking mm-hmm. about here, because he's like, it, "I knew it. We can't do it." And what I really like is that Ironhide literally puts his hand over Huffer's mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this he, is where Ironhide speaks for all of us. Yeah, he proposes they go with Cybertron with Chip in order to defeat yeah. this foreboding computer lock. <laughs> so Ironhide knows the way to uh, handle Huffer. Just shut him up. This is a great line from Chip here too. Where he's like, so, again, the 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 thing to understand about why I love this character so much is he's so Clark Kent, perfectly square. Mm-hmm. He's like he's like all the squareness of Clark Kent, but with the courage of Superman. Uh, it's it like, I, what are we waiting for? I always wanted to go to another planet. <laughs> <laughs> like like, there's nobody in that room is like, what a cool guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so great. So. So meanwhile, in Decepticon, Starscream's wondering why they don't attack the Autobots now that Prime's gone. But Megatron remarks that they attack when he says so. He's got to place a call to Cybertron. When will the space bridge materialize? Within 72 billion astroseconds at these coordinates. Oh boy, 72 billion astroseconds. Whew. Mm -hmm. Now, like... There was only an episode or so ago where it was like 3,000 astroseconds or something like that, and now something it's like 72 that. billion. <laughs> so even if we assume an astrosecond is a second long, just, just for a little assumption here, 72 uh-huh. billion seconds is over 2,200 years. So astroseconds have to be much, much tinier than a second. See, I'm thinking it's like a, a millionth of a second or something like that. I haven't done the math on it, but yeah, I always I'm assumed not do it any was more than math than that. But uh, okay, I'm with you. It has to be less than a hundredth of a second because that would mean it's 22 years. 
That would mean so. Uh, uh, that would mean Shockwave saying, "Oh, the Space Wars is going to open up in twenty-two years." So I don't think that's going to be the case. So we're dealing with very teeny tiny functions of time. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the, and that's how I've always thought about them. Is there's some preposterously small amount of time that like. Uh, a sentient robot would measure time by like they're so precise in their time that like oh you should have been here four astro seconds ago you know <laughs> you're late <laughs> like bumblebee was like by our reckoning bumblebee is like always on time but gears is measuring in astro seconds <laughs> like you're late again like oh come on gears it was like it was like 300 astro seconds <laughs> which like to us is like half of a second <laughs> and he's not a stickler either he's just a cybertronian that's <laughs> the way they are but yeah, 72 billion astroseconds. And this is part of the uh, romance. And I don't mean romances in like two, two people falling in love. I mean romances in like whimsical, creative, imaginative adventure is that they just come up with these unreal numbers of time measurement just to show like how exotic these creatures are. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I like that anyway. But then, yes. Uh, so it's going to be in 72 billion astroseconds. The space bridge is going to appear in the woods at least that's the imagery shows on the screen. <laughs> but it's not in the woods, is it? Well, back at the arc, Chip uses Teletran 1 to try to predict where the space bridge is going to be moved to. Yeah. And at the actual space bridge, Starscream and Rumble are loading up Energon cubes for the trip. Reflectors laying down the typical space bridge donut part that we talked about last time and the track mm-hmm. to it. Mm-hmm. And Rumble remarks that, hey, I thought we needed a driver to get this stuff back to Cybertron. And Starscream says, we do. And he grabs a nearby reflector bot who is not one of the three that's building the track in the donut. So there's like mm-hmm. a, a fourth random reflector there. And this this one doesn't talk like the other reflector either. He has Ken Sansom's hound voice. And we hear the warrior not be so happy with this command. No! Please! Not me! No! Have a nice journey, warrior. Say hi to the old gang on Cybertron! Okay, now we're going to get to uncorking some more Hoover theories, right? About, like, how can there be an extra reflector there? I just want to say, like, from the, 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 the Jersey side of the analysis or interpretation of the show, this is another moment that, again, as a young person, made the show feel so much more serious than any other cartoon I was watching in that not only did it show a bad guy jeopardizing the life of a fellow bad guy, but against that other bad guy's will. Right. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's not like, well, we're all nobly making our sacrifices for the great cause or anything. It's like, nope, I don't want to do it. I'm going to make you do it. No, please don't make me do it. You know, like, well, I'm lifting you up. I'm putting you in the thing. There you go. Don't die. (laughs) (laughs) Again, this whole episode, like there's so much like I, I wouldn't say dark, but like heavier ideas than what we've got at that time so Mm -hmm. but now i am curious how do you explain that there are four reflectors there and one of them doesn't talk like reflector but instead just gets shuffled off the cybertron (laughs) reflector's like yeah that's fine (laughs) well script wise they just said it was like a random decepticon warrior and he just got drawn like this because if if anyone's going to fill out the back uh background scenes it's going to be usually funny colored seekers or other reflector robots. So they just happen to draw this guy as a reflector robot. And uh, theory-wise, basically, it's my theory that since reflector is only three robots who talk as one because Skywarp was lazy and he dragged three of them at one time over to Teletran 1 back in the first episode and Teletran just scanned it as one being when it was actually three robots... Uh, we talked about that back in episode one. Anyway, yeah. uh, so all the other reflector robots you see in the series are probably just single dudes who have single voices and all that. And they probably transform into other random useless things you never see, like chairs or AM radios or record players. I see. So they're they're like appliance-grade Decepticons. <laughs> they're the can openers of the team. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to say this one turns into a record player. So let's name him Purple Vinyl. And now you can okay. write into tfwiki.net and make it make it official canon. 
<laughs> That's right. Another agenda of this show is to make <laughs> dumb ideas into canon. Uh, whatever this guy turns into, like he, they put him in the little like space bridge car. Yep. And then like send him up to Cybertron. And into space he goes, and he safely arrives on Cybertron. Little elevator door opens in uh, Shockwave's office, and there he is. But Teletran One, the greatest detective on Earth, <laughs> step aside, Batman. Uh accurately predicts the space bridge's location so that means like just after they send up those energon cubes to shockwave the autobots show up and we get a we get a like actually kind of a cool fight here there's uh, mm -hmm. there's some nice little bits of animation coming up but like so uh what happens first when the autobots show up well reflector attacks using his flash at least the middle reflector robot who has the uh lens on his chest and he temporarily blinds the autobots and as that's happening, Rumble uses his pile drivers. Which, like, causes an earthquake. And then there's this bit where a Starscream comes running at them. I don't know if you noticed this, but, like, I grabbed this as, like, here's another one of those nice things they do in the early seasons that they just stop doing altogether, is we see Ironhide and the Autobots all in a defensive pose. And Ironhide says, what a sorry sight for sore eyes. And as he says that, Starscream runs into the foreground. Mm -hmm. We see, like, it's sort of like his waist and legs as he's coming into this shot. And the focus shifts from Ironhide in the background. It all becomes fuzzy, and Starscream comes into focus. So, like, that sort of, like, depth of field kind of thing, mm -hmm. which you can do in animation, like, you know, in the 80s, pretty okay. They just don't do it anymore. And that was such a nice shot. It's a, such a nice, like... I don't know, just visually very, very pleasing and, and also gives us a really good sense of uh, blocking where the characters are in relation to one another. Mm. So it starts raining, too. This is an important piece of information here. Like a storm kicks in just as the this fight begins. And and also, can we also say that like a lot of trees get unnecessarily killed at this scene? <laughs> <laughs> well, for whatever reason, Starscream is, you know, typically fully armed. He's got a gun on each arm. And sometimes yeah. he even has missiles uh, in his chest. But for whatever yeah. reason, Starscream decides to uproot a tree to swing at the Autobots. This is what a POS he is. is that <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not enough for him to crush his enemies. He has to kill an innocent living thing to do it. And he has such contempt for his enemies that he won't even waste a laser on them. I'm going to mm -hmm. bash you to death with the corpse of a thing I just killed. Oh my gosh. I kind of hate you now, Starscream. <laughs> but Megatron is, is seeing the fight and he tells Starscream to let the Autobots win. And this yeah, he's like, the rain gave me an idea. This distracts Starscream long enough for him to get blasted by Ironhide's liquid nitrogen. And for yep. Reflector to get blasted by Blue Streak as one robot is blasted into the other and then into the third, causing each to disappear upon impact. What? Yeah. This seems odd, doesn't it? And I, I don't understand what's happening here. Well, this was the only time something like this happened, but somewhere in the original show scripts, it stated that Reflector's two other robots were simply manifestations he could produce, not unlike Madrox the Multiple Man in Marvel's X-Books. But this is really the only time anyone paid attention to that. So again, down Reflector goes. So it's another case, just like with Laserbeak earlier, where it's like somebody was actually reading the tech specs and everything, but no one else paid attention to it. So weirdly <laughs> enough, the person following the rules seems like they're out of order when it's really everyone yeah. else. So it's kind of unusual. So in other words, let's go back to the name of the writer for this episode. So <laughs> this is written, written by Donald F. Glutt. So he is the Hoover of the writers of the series mm. in that he combed through all the material to make sure that he was getting his continuity exactly right. And in the end, he just looks wrong. So that's, that's a yeah, yeah. bad reward. There's a life lesson for you. <laughs> Try harder. You'll be punished for it. Exactly. Um, <laughs> the trailbreaker manages to take down rumble and the Autobots, uh, do get the advantage over the Decepticons? Of course, uh, they kind of threw the fight there. Mm -hmm. So they use the space bridge and shockwave has quite the surprise as they show up in his office. Mm -hmm. But the Autobots are on a timetable. They got something to do. 
they basically muscle right past Shockwave, and they uh, kind of blow up a, a hole in the wall. <laughs> yeah, this part's weird because, like, first of all, I mean, Ironhide, we know he is a chemist. He has a internal chemical lab, and he can produce all sorts of crazy chemicals out, out of his hands. And he just used liquid nitrogen earlier in the fight with Starscream where mm-hmm. he froze him to stop him. But then, like, he runs up to a wall in Shockwave's office, and there's, like, this weird, like, sort of, like, looks like a gas tank with, like, a hose coming out of it. And he sees it while, like, Shockwave's shooting at him. He stops, he looks like, hmm. And he grabs it off the wall. He's like, some liquid nitrogen should cool things off. And he sprays the wall with the stuff out of that canister, and the wall just explodes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, my again, my fifth grade teacher brought liquid nitrogen into the classroom and did the thing where you put a, a flower in the nitrogen and then smash it, right? Did he coat the so wall like, in I, it and have it explode? He did. It was amazing. It was the greatest day of fifth grade ever. Greatest day of school ever. <laughs> no, but so, like, I get it that if he sprayed the wall with liquid nitrogen, it would be brittle and he could probably, you know, I don't, could he, I don't know if structural integrity would be compromised by that. Would it? I don't know. Well, this cartoon but, it sure would. It's a weird bit of business, but it's the weirdest part for me is that like you just showed him you make it come out of his hands. Why does he have to like get a backpack in a in a hose to do it now? But okay. And then like as they're running away through the hole, he like squats down and like shoots some weird green viscous fluid out of his fingertips at Shockwave's feet. <laughs> it's super glue. So Shockwave and poor little purple vinyl are stuck where they're standing. Yeah. Well, meanwhile, Megatron has placed a call to somebody else on Cybertron. Three very annoyingly colored Seekers who are fluorescent green, slate blue, and bright yellow. And these guys go unnamed in the episode, but were re- retroactively named by fans Acid Storm for the green one, Ion Storm for the blue one, and Nova Storm for the yellow one, or collectively the Rainmakers. Is that for real? That like that's They, they call them the Rainmakers? Mm-hmm. Yep. I I like the idea of like those guys being like, hi, we're the Rainmakers (laughs) and we're best friends. (laughs) Not everybody can be best friends. It's just partly in cloudy. See episode two. (laughs) You know, everybody loves somebody. (laughs) But okay, so Megatron says, destroy them with rain, acid rain. Before we get into acid rain, because like this, this has some historical context too for those who didn't grow up in the eighties. But I'm going to push back on the word "annoyingly colored" because <laughs> uh, I personally love the color scheme of these guys, and I wish that the the acid storm figure that they made, which you got me one mm-hmm. year for uh, the holidays, and I love them to death because I I I told the story in a microcast, uh, you know, in the lead up to this show, mm-hmm. is that when I was a kid. I did that thing where you come home from school and then take a nap and then kind of wake up out of a deep sleep or a dream and you forget exactly what time it is, like that kind of headspace where like you wake up in the afternoon, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm late for school. No, it's actually eight at night. You just missed dinner, that kind of mm-hmm. thing. Um, and I woke up in that kind of headspace where like I wasn't quite fully awake and I wasn't dreaming anymore, but I was dreaming that I had a bright green Decepticon jet and I didn't know its name, which should have been a tip off to me Mm -hmm. that it was a dream. But I ran around the house yelling at my siblings, like, where's my green jet? What did you do with it? Where did you guys put it? I want my green jet. They're like, what are you talking about? You know, and then then I woke up and I was like, realized, oh, that was just a dream. It was a beautiful dream where I had a green Decepticon jet and he was bright green like that. (laughs) So I like the idea of there actually... This may sound strange coming from me as somebody who's like got a little bit worn out by how brightly colored the Decepticons got like post 1987. <laughs> but the idea of a bright, yeah, bright yellow and a bright green seeker, I think is very appealing. Well, it's not so much that I find the fluorescence of them annoying. It's just that like the whole body is that color. It's not like on <laughs> Starscream or Skywarp or Thundercracker where it's like, the blue and the black and the gray is offset by another color yeah. for parts. I could see that. It's just like they, I see that. they just slapped paint on the whole thing. But with the Acid Storm toy that they released later on, he's like a, more of a forest green. Mm-hmm. He's not quite as like a bright 
you know, like I would say like a Kermit the Frog green as this this the Decepticon is. I do like that when Megatron orders them to make acid rain, they transform. And this was where they were paying attention in the show. They don't turn into F-15s. They turn into those weird Florodary swooshy triangles yep. that, that like take off right off the ground out into the sky. But can we talk about acid rain for a minute? <laughs> Why Why would this come into the episode? What is Acid Rain? Is this more romance in the cartoon? Or is this something else? Do you remember all the news stories about Acid Rain when we were kids? No. I mean, I remember it as a thing, but not really anything beyond that. So if I remember right, now I haven't gone back to research this, but I remember there being news stories about how chemical pollution in the sky has gotten to such a state. It's so bad now that... It's changing the pH balance of the water that falls out of the sky when it rains. And this water is becoming more and more acidic. Science. And the news came up with the term acid rain. Now, as, a, as an 11 year old, when I saw that on the news and there's, you know, Peter Koppel and John Stossel telling me to be afraid all the time on TV, <laughs> I thought it was going to be like, oh my gosh, by the time I'm a grown up, rain is going to burn through umbrellas, you know, and it's going to burn my clothes. It's going to burn my skin and everything. Like in movies like RoboCop didn't help matters where like they had those fake commercials for like that sunblock that was like completely <laughs> opaque that you had to put on. <laughs> so this was a thing that was like on Americans' minds in it, during this time. It's like the, the, the danger of more and more acidic rain falling and like basically like causing corrosion of you know exteriors of buildings monuments cars etc but it wasn't anything where it's like it was gonna like get into your circuitry and disable you like megatron's acid rain does but yeah so when he said acid rain like this was something that like that's the thing i heard in the news oh no this show is even scarier now <laughs> <laughs> so they, they take off and fly into the sky, and then we cut back to Wheeljack's lab. Where the Autobots and Chip are facing off against their greatest enemy, a computerized lock. Well. If only they had the Matrix to light their darkest hour. <laughs> That's what Vulture Magnus would have done. <laughs> mm, it's locked. Let me see if I can unleash the power of the Matrix. Uh, but, uh... We're we're coming in midstream. Chip's, Chip's been at this for a while, right? Mm -hmm. At least entire seconds, possibly even minutes. He says yeah. he's going to try one last combination, and it opens. You did it, Chip! <laughs> That's what Trailbreaker says. And then uh, Ironhide walks in and is like, let's see if I can find it. And then he looks around <laughs> once. He's like, there it is. <laughs> so this formerly Herculean task has pretty much been accomplished in seven yeah. seconds but here come the rainmakers and they fire lasers into the red clouds and they cause literal acid rain to fall down onto cybertron or at least the specific part of cybertron that the autobots are standing on can we can i ask you have we seen clouds on cybertron before at this point i do not believe so yeah this this feels odd, like unusual like I, I know in later iterations of the series, like especially Transformers Prime, like the atmosphere of Cybertron is emphasized as like a thing. You can see it. But like up until this point, Cybertron looks like the moon as far as the atmosphere. Just like it's just space all the time. Like mm -hmm. like even when it's fully lit by daylight, you see outer space. Mm -hmm. You know? So it's weird all of a sudden, like, yeah, there's these red clouds that are like forming overhead and then the Decepticon jets go into the clouds and just start shooting around a little bit and it starts raining and not just any rain, like glowing red rain falls out of the sky. Mm -hmm. To me, that sort of tells me that these aren't like natural clouds that would form. This is some sort of weapon that's been yeah. uh, designed by Shockwave or somebody to, to say, let's say rain on the Autobots parade. You know, that <laughs> it's not just <laughs> some naturally occurring thing. So it's like a Destro kind of thing. Yeah, something like that. So they okay. fire the lasers into the clouds and it starts raining on the Autobots. And uh, just contact with the rain has the Autobots falling over and on the ground suffering. Yeah, like they're all groaning. And like they, they, I think this is where we get to our first or second commercial break where 
uh, Bumblebee is reaching out to Chip, who's clearly not affected by the acid rain, right? Mm -hmm. He's sitting there, calm as can be, and Bumblebee's reaching out to him, going, like, we failed, and then it cuts to commercial. (laughs) And Megatron takes the time to gloat about how well things are going, and he (laughs) writes off the Autobots that are here on Cybertron, because clearly they're finished. Starscream pipes in, saying that they should attack the Autobot HQ now, and mark your calendars... Because Megatron's going to agree with Starscream. Not only does he agree, he puts his hand on Starscream's arm. <laughs> he like he like puts his arm, like hand on his arm like a friend, like, all right, buddy, let's go kill everybody. <laughs> and then Tumblr went crazy. <laughs> so many images of Megatron carrying Starscream. <laughs> and Starscream carrying Megatron. But, um, yeah, so... <laughs> you have some issues with the animation coming up here, huh? Yeah, apparently the animators had Bring Your Children to Work Day because the episode starts getting drawn by the animator's toddlers, apparently. Because Why? everything What's going suddenly on? looks like crap. The camera what are you talking movement about? loses all sense. If you look at the scene of the Decepticons leaving their base, heading towards the Ark, yeah. it's literally like crap. <laughs> <laughs> Like, like things aren't finished and it's, it's like, it's like, it's, it's like if you ask a six year old to draw a Megatron, there it is. Boom. So is it, is it them leaving the base that looks bad? I don't, mm-hmm. I, I'd have to go back and rewatch the scene. Yeah. I didn't notice this. Yeah. There's one scene where they're flying away from the base and it's just the messiest thing and messiest <laughs> Decepticons you've ever seen. Oh, I see. That's why you're so mad about it. Because if it was Huffer looking all goofy, you'd well, be like, that would yeah, be well, that would be normal. But Megatron, <laughs> godliness. So, <laughs> so yes, they fly off in a very clumsy and awkward way. Mm, then two scenes later, it's like the grown-ups start animating again. So it's like I don't know if certain companies or studios did certain segments of the show, but. There's rarely a show in these early ones that's just that looks the same all the way through. There's always mm-hmm. some sort of clear dip where it starts getting animated very poorly for a while. So I don't know the details on why. Neither do I. And but I I have a hypothesis is I wonder how many of these were like hastily created scenes to like fit, fill in editing. Mm. Right? It's like, "Oh, we never showed the Decepticons leave the base," you know? It's like we cut like the scene ended with Megatron patting Starscream on the arm, and it's like, oh, but we never showed the part where they're actually heading for headquarters. How are we going to bridge that gap? Okay, well, let's quickly animate something. Yeah, but I don't know. I don't know how the animation industry worked back then. I don't know how it works now. I'm a comic book artist, not an animator, so <laughs> that is total conjecture. Do not take that to TF Wiki. <laughs> okay, so. So then we cut back to the Autobots slowly dying under the acid rain and Bumblebee just keeps saying, like, we failed, Mm -hmm. we failed. The acid rain is disrupting our circuitry. Who's going to rally the troops if not Bumblebee? I know. He's like the heart of the team. Who's going to motivate the Autobots here, Jersey? Who's it going to be? We can't fail. Optimus Prime, our our world, the whole universe depends on us. Fail, Chip. Acid storm disabled circuit tree. No one's ever really disabled as long as he has courage. <laughs> well, guys, do we quit or fight? Maybe I still have enough power left to shield us from this killer rain. Way to go, Trailbreaker! Now your automatic repair systems can put you back in shape! And while they work, I'll take care of our three Raiders! <laughs> I never did like rain, acid, or otherwise. So, yeah, this it, this is a little on the nose. Yeah, it's like, like they say, like, oh, the acid rain disabled our circuitry. Disabled! Our circuitry, Chip, in the wheelchair. And then Chip responds that no one's really disabled as long as they have courage. Look, I know that these characters are not for everybody, but like it works on me like a drug. If you have somebody with a really square, sincere, nerdy voice saying something that's like 
totally canned but yet inspirational it can get if i was there dying under the acid rain i would get up the way trailbreaker does (laughs) it's just really kind of annoying how trailbreaker (laughs) has always had this force field he could have been using it the entire time it just didn't cross his mind so he says oh i guess i can use my force field it's kind of like when you're like, it's raining in the parking lot and you're like, well, is it raining hard enough that I can like run to my car? If I just run to my car, I won't get that wet. And then like you get halfway through, you're like, oh no, <laughs> it was much worse than I thought it was. Uh, maybe it's like that. Like, cause like when they say acid rain, we got to get moving or prime's a goner. Like they all start running. Right. Mm-hmm. So like, maybe they thought it wasn't that bad, but then like, like why you, I don't want to go through breaking out my whole umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting on my raincoat. I'll just make a dash for it. And then they're like, oh, no, it was too much. And then Trailbreaker remembers, yes, I, I guess I can open my umbrella. <laughs> he turns on his force field. And Blue Streak fires at the Rainmaker. So magically, our heroes are as good as new after just a few beats. Well, it, Chip says, now your automatic repair systems will put you back into shape. Mm-hmm. So it's time to go back to Shockwave's office so they can catch the first space bridge out to Earth. And conveniently, there's no waiting in line. They blow right past Shockwave and Purple Vinyl. Shockwave and Purple Vinyl are surprised by the reappearance of the Autobots into Shockwave. Well, office. yeah, he even says this is the fir- one of the few times you ever hear Shockwave emote, right? Like most of the time, he's like, "Oh, hail Megatron! I'm mm-hmm. being very loyal and and I love you." But like when they come back, he's like, "The fools! They're back!" <laughs> you know he's he's really he's really taken aback by this. He did not expect it. You know, and and, and Corey Burton delivers that in the performance. Mm-hmm. Like he just finally got free of all that glue. You know, and he's like, "What are they doing back here?" <laughs> so he, he fires at him, mm-hmm. and they get away. Yeah. Well, you know why Shockwave misses all these shots, Jersey? Why? Shockwave only has one eye, so he <gasps> probably doesn't have no any depth, depth perception. perception. That's what it is. Oh, see, unlocking the mysteries of Transformers <laughs> inconsistencies. <laughs> so that's why Shockwave misses every shot he takes at the Autobots, even if they're 10 feet in front of him. It's because the poor guy just sees in one dimension. This week on the Transformers Detectives. Starring <laughs> So, yeah, so the, he misses them a whole bunch of times and they get into the space bridge and like, okay, so if you're going to get persnickety and uptight, space bridge only operates for short amounts of time. It comes and it goes. Yeah, there was no waiting involved. <laughs> they just happened to time it just right, apparently. Apparently they did. I'm I'm chalking this up to just efficiency of storytelling. Like, look, we're in the third act. We got to wrap this thing up in under 21 <laughs> minutes. It's it's just still that's why Ironhide was in such a hurry to find the Cosmotron when they opened up the door, right? Mm-hmm. It's like we gotta it wasn't get this dying or anything. It's like we gotta catch the space bridge before it goes again. Well, well, I mean yeah, that's kind of important to fixing Prime is getting back home, right? <laughs> they make it back. The chip says like, all right, we gotta get back to the base. How fast can you go, Bumblebee? And Bumblebee says, hang on to your teeth, which I don't know what that means, but like it sounds intense. <laughs> I've never driven so fast that my teeth fall out. <laughs> Unless it's because he doesn't have seat belts or something. <laughs> the Autobots are speeding back to the uh, Ark, but who else is on their way to the Ark? The Decepticons. And they're in the lead. Yep. Yeah, we, we cut to Autobot base, and Wheeljack and Ratchet are feverishly working on Prime, and uh, Sparkplug's having the difficult conversation with his son, saying like, you know what? Sometimes you just can't fight City Hall. <laughs> things, things are going to be bigger than you, and it's going to, you know, like nature is the toughest kid in the block, and it's a big, rabid dog, so I chew you up and spit you out. At least that's how it felt when I was a kid, when he's like, sometimes there's not much you could do. And it cuts the spike, and he's like, Optimus Prime, dead? I'm like, Dang! And then, and then it's like, okay, well, Optimus is about to die, and then Wheeljack turns to the Teletran one. He's like, oh yeah, um, all the Decepticons are coming, <laughs> <laughs> and it looks like all of them. And so basically, Huffer has an emotional <laughs> breakdown right there. He does. He's just like we're doomed. I don't think he's not like in the fetal position, rocking back. If this and were forth. Battlestar Galactica, Huffer would grab a gun and just shoot himself in the head. <laughs> Whoa, was that a real thing? Yes. <laughs> and I'm talking the 2003 Battlestar Galactica. Oh, good Lord. I haven't watched that, so I'm missing out on that reference. 
Okay, so Huffer says, we're doomed. We're no match for the Decepticons. So they just like kind of shut the doors and put their fingers in their ears. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we have someone else to rally the troops. Chip isn't here at, at the Ark, so who's going to rally the troops now, Jersey? We can't go down without trying. Prime would want us to go for it, no matter what the odds. Well, are you with me? Or do I fight this battle alone? Son, you can't. But we can. We get your message, Spike. Autobots, transform! Yeah, so, man. Jersey got to hear Chip rally the troops on Cybertron. And now he gets to hear Spike rally the troops in the Ark. So Jersey won't be with us for the rest of this episode because he's crying with love and admiration for the humans right now. So, <laughs> so I, I have I have a uh, a point to make about this. First, this episode does a really good job of making the point that humans they point to the emotional growth that the Autobots need in the story. Right. Mm-hmm. It, it almost feels like it's operating on a principle that, well, they're robots. So they're f- I mean, this goes to something we talked about before, too, is like the 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 Autobots are all grown ups. They're fully formed. They know what to do. They know who to vote for. They know what choices to make. Right. Like everything <laughs> just feels like and that's part of the power fantasy of it, at least for me as a kid. But the humans are there to say, yeah, but you don't see this yet. I'm here to point you at the emotional growth you need to make. You got to find more courage. You have to dig down deeper and, you know, use the resources that you have to combat the things that you're encountering. Right. And that's what the scene is about, too, is like the it's this is where I felt like the theme of the story or the moral or point, whatever you want to call it, the story points to something really interesting. The Decepticons. Let's look at the Decepticons. Megatron is strong. He's merciless. He can't be beaten and you'll never be our leader. Starscream is the only guy who thinks that Megatron is fallible of the whole Mm. team, right? So you have bad guys who worship their leader. And now you have a situation where, hey, the good guys kind of worship their leader too. But what if, what if that leader was incapacitated? Would they rise up? Would they find a greater inner strength and come together as a team to maybe even in the in the the leader's name, maybe in like tribute to the hero or the leader or whatever. But they find out that yeah, the leader's there and the leader's important, but the leader is only as great as the group that they're leading or something along that line, right? Like something about how like the the team coming together is also a powerful factor in making a really really good team. And when Huffer is saying we can't do it, he's arguing the Decepticons' point of view, right? He's saying like we can't do anything without our beloved leader and Spike. The wonderful, brave, beloved human. I got another point about humans in a second. He says, no, we have to go out and push even harder and dig deeper the same way Chip said that. Now, let's point out, why would humans be the ones to do this? Because humans are more limited than the Autobots, right? Autobots can pull their hands inside the forearms, make fire extinguishers, make (laughs) zip lines, make all sorts of things, right? They are giant robots who could turn into other things. They can drive really fast. They can fly really far. They got cool uh, paint jobs. They're aliens. They live forever, right? They have so many advantages over us. Well, then, well, how would, what advantage could we have over them? Well, it's because we are so bound by limitation. We have to always overcome limitation in a way that they don't have to. And so we point at greater growth for these magnificent giant angelic robots all the time. That's why I love humans in this show so much. And this episode is like almost a perfect encapsulation of that idea for me. <laughs> And let's not bury the lead here. Spike grabs an Autobot's gun. <laughs> it's right. It's like Jazz is like standing there in front of the computer with his gun in his hand. And Spike just like starts pulling out of Jazz like, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let the kid play with it. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like the size of a surfboard. <laughs> so Brave Spike has rallied the troops and the Autobots go out front. And horrible animation comes and goes here. The Autobots are heading outside to fend off the Decepticon threat. And there's lots of typical squaring off, like, this character's fighting this character, this character's fighting this character. There's one great shot where Huffer manages to punch Thundercracker off of a cliff right as he lands. That's pretty good. Of all characters to do it, too, it's Huffer. That's the, and see that that's pointing to that theme I was talking about, right? Like they're they're growing beyond their self described limitations, mm-hmm. and even Huffer's being courageous and punching like one of the top dogs of the Decepticons right in the face. Yeah. <laughs> so, so of course they're gonna they're gonna prevail, right? Well, you think uh, because meanwhile the four Autobots uh, who went to Cybertron with Chip they get back to the Ark, 
and Bumblebee speeds right in to give Ratchet and Wheeljack the Cosmotron that they've been waiting for as the other three Autobots join the fight. But outside, you know, it's it's not too long before the Decepticons manage to get the upper hand and basically the Autobots are just all smoking rubble outside of the Ark. Of course, Bumblebee, Wheeljack, and Ratchet are still inside repairing Prime, but Megatron takes the time to celebrate his victory. We are victorious! Is there anyone in the universe who'll challenge the might of Megatron? There is one Megatron. I, Optimus Prime, challenge you. Optimus Prime? He lives? Our leader's back. So, watching this again as a young person, I remember the part where you hear Wind Charger say, our leader is back. Like, that gave me chills as a kid, right? And it's like, oh, now things are going to turn around. I guess as I think about this more, like, I feel like when I was watching this again, I felt like, oh, this is a missed opportunity because, like, it could have been about how the Autobots rise up and, like, Optimus shows up at the end and being like, wow, you guys did this without me. Mm-hmm. And I guess and I guess you don't need me. And they're like, no, no, we need you, you know, because, like, you're the great leader who, who gave us the inspiration to do this thing, right? But instead, it's like, oh, they all just get beaten. Like, it's like, oh, you know, Prime would want us to, to, to do our best, which suggests that they're going to succeed. But no, they fail. <laughs> you're not as good as Optimus Prime, right? <laughs> but I guess coming up next, we got this scene where things turn around, but not because Optimus comes in and smokes all of the Decepticons. Mm-hmm. It's because Megatron is a dummy and says, hey, who who wants to take me on? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like the, the Autobots wore him down so that when Optimus sh- shows up, he could say, all right, I'll take you on. And then Starscream very cleverly uh, jumps on Megatron's language, right? <laughs> he points out the battle code of a challenge requires that Megatron fight him alone. And this is something that will come up later in an episode mm-hmm. called Heavy Metal War. That's right. So I like the fact that they're sort of establishing things that do get brought back up. So Megatron's like, okay, fine, I'll take on Prime. I don't care. So Prime lunges at him, and the two tussle. Prime pushes Megatron off of a cliff and then he fires on his writhing body. And there's this great scene where <laughs> it's a funny Megatron, image. Megatron looks like a newborn baby. He's just sort of like <laughs> kicking and screaming on his back on the ground. Yeah. Yeah. And like he's like, he's like, he's, Optimus is just like shooting into his chest and his arms right. like just like wriggling like a baby in a, in a, in a carriage. But then like you would think that'd be like screaming, but instead Megatron's like, ah, oh, I used too much energy fighting the Autobots. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, I need assistance. I've used too much power against the Autobots. I need assistance. How unfortunate. If you cannot fight your opponent yourself, you are not fit to be our leader. I am the only suitable leader anyway. Again, we're, we're still in like the early Starscream voice where he's not quite as screamy and he's much more like a uh, kind of a, a prig. I take it back. This wasn't a failed opportunity. I guess if you really look at what happens in the story, the Autobots wore the Decepticons down so that Megatron used too much energy so that when Prime did come back, he can make short work of them. And thank goodness for a conniving legalese expert like Starscream who would call, you know, <laughs> trap Megatron with his own language so that he would have to be defeated and humiliated so that Starscream could be aggrandized. <laughs> There's a little bit more fight left, right? Yeah, Prime actually uses eye lasers on Megatron at one point. Like, okay. okay, I don't know where those came from, but... And eventually Megatron yields, and Starscream orders a retreat and take our leader back for repairs. That's a nice That's a nice shot when he says that. It's like a three-quarter up shot looking at Starscream where he's got his arms crossed all satisfied. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the Autobots cheer. Yeah. Yeah, this is a little weird. It's like, they, like Optimus climbs to the top of a hill and starts like holding his arms up in the air like a football player. And all the other <laughs> Autobots are raising their arms like football players. Like, yeah! <laughs> and then, it, and of course, in a lot of these episodes, the battle ends at sunset. <laughs> the subject guns fly away. And Spike and Chip contemplate, you know, the, 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 the state of things at the end of this. Chip says, well, I guess that takes care of the Decepticons. <laughs> Yep, they're completely <laughs> gone. We never see them again, Chip. <laughs> Surely after that uh, trouncing that Optimus gave them, they won't have the, the audacity to come back, right? 
that was that was very embarrassing for all of them. So now they'll go home and maybe they'll rethink their choices. <laughs> <laughs> but Spike uh, is sure that they'll be back. <laughs> yeah, it's like yeah, they will be back. Yeah, I, I guess uh, you know Chip just hasn't had enough experience with them, whereas Spike is <laughs> he's he's grizzled. <laughs> Uh, the humans are so wise this episode. <laughs> so, and then it ends. It ends with the Decepticons flying away and Spike making the haunting suggestion that, they, you know, we can tune in next week for another adventure. <laughs> 10,000 foot up thoughts on this one? How does, how does this one rank for you? I don't love it. It's yeah. interesting to see a Cybertron again and Cybertronic Seekers again. One thing I'd like to talk about is that at this point in the series, there is no talk of the Matrix whatsoever. It hasn't been conceptualized yet. Well, in in the comic books. In the animated series, at least. Right. In the animated series, it has not been thought about at all yet. Yeah. So when Prime gets blown up, you know, we're sort of retroactively asking ourselves, well, was the Matrix right there? I mean, we certainly mm. never see it as Wheeljack and Ratchet are digging around in his chest exactly where the Matrix would go. Mm-hmm. So it's, I wouldn't say always, but I would say it's sort of my theory that I don't think Prime has the Matrix yet. Mm. I don't think he gets it until maybe, maybe even after season two, but you know, there's lots of dealings with alpha Trion on Cybertron, uh, during season two. And mm-hmm. I think at this point in my personal head canon, I would say, I would say alpha Trion is still holding on to the matrix, not necessarily having it inside him, although maybe, mm. but he's at least like keep keeping it safe in my mind. Because mm. if you think about it, I mean, Megatron and Prime, when they came to Earth, it was just sort of like an accident. You know, it wasn't like, we're going to take a long, four million years uh, long journey. You know, it was just like, let's go try to find some energy. It was like a day trip. Mm-hmm. It wasn't yeah. planned to be like a whole big thing. So I don't really feel at this point that Prime is necessarily the commander of all Autobots everywhere. It just seems mm. like that's he slowly grows into that role and eventually he will have the matrix, but it doesn't feel like he does yet. Hmm. Or if he was, it could be something where he maybe went to alpha Trion before he left and said like, Hey, hang on to this for me. I don't know what could happen out there. And you might need to appoint somebody else a leader. Yeah. Right? You might have to, you might have to give it to Alita one who I told to stay home because it's too dangerous for female <laughs> Autobots to go on an adventure with me later on. Yikes, double yikes, triple yikes. <laughs> we'll get to that when we get to the search for Alpha Trion. But yeah, it could be something like that too. I hadn't thought about that. I also thought, I mean, here's like to put a, not to put a wrench in the, in the, the thought, but just to sort of like pr- produce other potential branches of thought on this. We do know that when we see the Matrix in Transformers, the movie, Galvatron fires point blank at it and lasers bounce off of it. Now, I know it was glowing with the light of the lighting their darkest hour, but I wonder if like there's something inherently indestructible about the Matrix, right? Mm. Like maybe it's something where it's like it's it's down underneath all that mess that op- that Ratchet and, and, and uh, Wheeljack are digging around in. And when he blows up, it's like the Matrix is like, that's fine, yeah. you know, because I, I have to be ready for the next leader anyway, you know? So I wonder if there's something about that, that it's like you can't harm it in that way. You can deplete it, you know, but you can't destroy it. I don't mm-hmm. know. Yeah, could be. I mean, it's basically whatever you whatever you think in your head. So, <laughs> I mean, the cartoon is not going to reference it until the movie. Yeah. And, I mean, for me, it's more fun to speculate than to try to find, like, a, a, a an actual through line for the canon this is this is where you and i like sort of diverge as fans whereas like you will sit there with your cork board in your bedroom with a bunch mm-hmm. of push pins and yarn between different <laughs> photographs of megatron and starscream and alpha trion of vector sigma <laughs> <laughs> and R- the rid combaticons also known as the decepticons ruination like we've had this discussion where you're like no no i figured it out i figured out how this how it makes sense that they could all be there and they could all be part of one, one continuous continuity. 
but yeah, yeah, this is we're, we're still in the point in the series where they're kind of developing the world, you mm-hmm. know, and so and this idea of like one on one combat comes up at least one more time, but then I don't know if it comes up again anymore after that. Yeah, so they're they're definitely still world building at this point, but it's uh, it's interesting. And as I look ahead, I'd like to point out that Heavy Metal War is also written by Donald F. Glut. So oh, and that's a good one this, too. Maybe this was a seed he intentionally planted for the future. Or it's like I'm just gonna go back to the same well. <laughs> right. <laughs> I was trying to put a positive spin on it. Yeah. <laughs> Jersey's pulling back the curtains, being a writer himself. <laughs> having having done <laughs> similar things yes uh and i i guess my ten thousand foot view would be is like I, in retrospect as i sat down and really asked myself what i thought about this one it's turning into one of my favorite episodes now because of what it's implicitly saying about humans role in the transformer show and now it's making me wish that there were more episodes like this. And and it's going to make me a lot more attentive to episodes like in season three when we get to like, what was it? The woman Daniel has all the nightmares. Was it Nightmare World? Um, I think so. Yeah. I'm going to start being a little bit more attentive to how they're handling the humans in these stories. Because like this, I feel like they're saying a lot of really, really cool stuff about humanity and like what it has to offer Cybertronians. Hmm. Beyond just my son Spike and I know Earth better than you do. <laughs> <laughs> Two words: Google Maps. <laughs> well, I All have right, to hand it to you. You only cried for about ten or twelve minutes that I had to edit out because <laughs> you were so touched by Chip and Spike in this episode. Oh, he's so brave. He's so good. And yeah, yeah. I, uh, my my only regret about my collection is I don't have like a really great Chip Chase and Spike action figure set. <laughs> Wait till we get to Carly. I mean, oh my gosh. Let's not leave the listeners with any uh, wrong ideas. You do have some Chip Chases, and you do have do. some Spikes. I do, I do, but like like not like a masterpiece like <laughs> level of Spike. It, it, it like they look like they walked off the show. You know, like 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 the like the, the the Masters of the Universe classics line or something like that. Like it looks like it's the animation model, and then so it has different any heads. Great customizers out there. <laughs> yeah, Jersey would love a wonderful looking, maybe GI Joe articulated Chip Chase figure. And and Spike and Spike should come with like angry firing up the troops face, and then like uh, really happy mm-hmm. face. And Chip should just have hopeful face, hopeful face, hopeful face. <laughs> And then, like, brave against Ravage face. Ah, uh, that's right. Spike goes out there with that giant laser gun, and like he te- he takes on Ravage. He takes on Ravage. He doesn't do very well, but he shouldn't because he's a human. <laughs> he should fail. But the fact that he goes down fighting, you know, he, he like points a giant laser gun at Ravage and tries to fight uh, to fight him. <laughs> See, that's why these characters are so great. Okay. Well, next time, we got another one that I've got a lot of feelings for, which is Fire in the Sky. Yeah, me uh, too. This this is one of my favorites as far as season one episodes go. And it's going to introduce a new character named Skyfire. We'll cover it next time on <laughs> Four Million Years Later. All right. Thank you, Hoover. This was fun. Thank you, Jersey. <laughs> See, he can't, he can't even say thank you in a sincere way. And thank you, Chip and Spike, for showing us the way. <laughs> oh, I'm doing my best. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Until next time, I've been Jersey Drozd of 4 million years com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I've been Hoover. Thank you for joining us. And see you next week when we see a fire in the sky. Okay, bye. Bye. Episode synopses are from imdb.com and some episode information taken from tfwiki.net. The closing theme is by Nick Mahalik, based on the original closing theme by Ford Kinder and Ann Bryant. You can find more of Nick's music at soundcloud.com slash nicholas Mahalik. That's spelled N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S dash M-E-H-A-L-I-C-K Find us on Facebook under 4 Million Years Later and you can email us at 4 Million Years Later at gmail.com Visit 4 Million Years Later dot com and if you haven't yet 
please subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. You know how it works. <laughs>